So this morning I have a video on Holtzbrook and three things they are currently doing with their existing axe line that I think they should change. I don't want anything in this video to be taken as um, a, you know, an attempt to unnecessarily disparage Holtzbrook and their brand. They are a high quality axe manufacturer and I do think highly of their brand. Uh, however, that being said, over the years using Holtzbrook products, I have identified some things that I think they should change in order to uh, probably not only streamline their manufacturing process, but also provide a more functional product and a better value to the consumer. So without further delay, here are three things Holtzbrook is currently doing that they should change. So the first mistake and the most serious mistake is producing this full-size splitting axe. This is the Holtzbrook Sarek. It is a three and a half pound head on a 32 inch handle. Um, I made a video some time ago where I essentially agreed with Ben Scott's conclusion that this is perhaps the worst splitting axe that money can buy. And I stand by that. Um, everything in that video, I stand by. At three and a half pounds, it's too light. The head is too long. The uh, cheeks are too thin. The bit's too short. Um, I've split quite a bit of wood with this. I've kind of forced myself to use it. And when you pay the money that the Holtzberg is, is asking for this ax, um, you, you know, you, you can, you can understand why, uh, this is almost a $200 ax. This is, I looked it up this morning, um, fairly close. It's, it's almost $190. Uh, you might be able to find it a little bit cheaper. Some, some places. Um, but this is an extremely expensive ax. Uh, the short bit makes it so if you're splitting around, the round is, is more likely to just absorb the bit. Um, the cheeks are too thin. So when your bit does get absorbed, that's going to stick. The head is so long that I, it, it's almost dangerous. I, I, in my opinion, because the long bit, uh, the long head and the short bit messes with your depth perception. And then when you do go to split, uh, the 32 inch handle makes it so you're more likely to have that ax come back to you than hit the ground or bury itself somewhere safe. Um, so I have enough experience with this ax to form a fairly well-educated opinion. And, and that is, this is one of, um, this is probably the only ax that I regret purchasing. <laughs> you know, I've, I've spent more money than I needed to on some axes. Um, but this is one ax that if I could go back uh, and undo that purchase and then put that money towards a, a functional splitting ax, I would do that in a heartbeat. Um, to call this a splitting ax, I think is, is it, it's borderline fantasy. Um, and to say that this is based on an old, um, you know, Scandinavian pattern. I haven't been able to find that pattern anywhere, not in Holtzbrook's old catalogs, you know, even some from the 1800s. Um, I, I haven't seen this pattern denominated as a splitting ax anywhere in, in my research. Not that I've looked overly hard, but I've looked and I can't find this pattern anywhere as a dedicated splitter. Um, if they want to offer this pattern, they should offer it alongside a functional splitting ax. And if you just like, you know, Scandinavia or Holtzbrook or, you know, whatever the case may be, you know, I won't knock your purchase of this ax, but if you want a functional splitter, here's what you should do instead. Um, again, that ax, almost $190. For half of that, you can purchase this ox head splitting mall. Uh, this is a phenomenal, or I should say splitting ax. This is a phenomenal splitting ax. Um, has a metal guard, nice wide bit, super chunky profile. This thing is heavy. If you have tough, knotty, gnarly wood, um, this is going to be your ax. Again, at half of the cost. And I will say, um, that's not the only company from Germany that's making a, a, a wonderful splitting ax. Um, in fact, Helco Work actually makes an incredible looking Scandinavian splitting ax. Uh, I don't own it. 
I don't really have the need for another splitter, but if I was going to purchase another splitting ax, it would probably be that Helka Work Scandinavian splitting ax. So if you're after a Scandinavian pattern, Helka Work is where you should go. And, and, and I believe it's actually cheaper than the Seric. So that's just to say, um, you can find a more functional ax for, for less, even if it's a Scandinavian ax that you want. This is another great splitting ax. This is the Council Tool FE6. It's got these amazing uh, grooves here that I, I like. I don't have the need for a Halligan bar. These are made for a Halligan bar. This is a firefighting tool um, that uh, is, makes a wonderful splitter. It's on a 36 inch handle. Um, and this handle is fantastic. I have not thinned it out. The only thing that I did is I added the Fawn's foot because you know, why not? <laughs> so this is a fantastic splitting ax. And this is, um, this is, um, let's see, a, a third of the cost. I, I think it was, um, this is 40 times less. This is a craftsman splitting mall, uh, 40 times less than, uh, than that Holzbrook Sarek. You can find splitting malls, I mean, everywhere. Um, it's, it's going to have the benefit of a hardened pole as well. The, the ox head, I'm not sure if the ox head has a hardened pole, uh, but this craftsman does. Um, and at 40 times less the cost, uh, I think is a great deal. Even I will reach for this Husky four pound splitter over that Sarek. And I believe this cost me maybe $40. Uh, it has a wonderful splitting profile. I have no idea what the steel is and I, I don't care, <laughs> you know, because it, it does the job. Um, you don't buy a splitting ax like this because of the steel. Um, this is just a functional ax at a great price and it is extremely durable. Um, I have used and abused this ax. If I need to split wood, in kind of a kind of a hairy location where there might be rocks and, and other things, I'll grab this ax and I have had to take chips out of the bit. It's been phenomenal. Um, so that is just to tell you that if you are after a functional splitting ax, oh, there we go, just about lost it. If you're after a functional splitting ax, even if you want a Scandinavian style splitting ax, this is not your axe. In fact, this axe is doing a great deal, in my opinion, a great deal of damage to the reputation of Holtzbrook. Uh, the people on YouTube that I have seen use this axe, I would not, you know, I, I think they purchased this axe new in their axe journey and uh, it, it's either going to discourage them from continuing their axemanship or whatever, ax womanship, ax personship, or it is going to discourage them from purchasing Holtzbrook products. So uh, those are my thoughts here on that um, Holtzbrook Sarek splitting ax. So the second mistake is related to this hatchet here. Uh, this has been my all around go-to camping hatchet for a while now. Uh, I really like the steel. It's a pound and a quarter. Uh, nice length, very, very packable. I have a belt loop that I just throw this in and uh, it's always there when I need it. Um, nice, nice cheeks. That makes it decent for splitting uh, kindling, uh, making shavings. It, uh, it's, it's a good weight. I like the weight a lot. A pound and a quarter is very capable. I even like the length. Uh, I wouldn't want it really much shorter or longer than it is for what I use it for. My problem with this design here is it, it should have more carving capabilities than it does. And I think that if a company is going to produce a, a hatchet, an all around hatchet, then carving has to be included as one of its features. And this is, I mean, it's basically a Dayton. It's basically a, a Dayton pattern axe and that makes it very difficult to carve with makes it quite uncomfortable because your index finger when you carve uh it it runs up against the two sharp edges of the head 
Uh, one of the reasons I love the German patterns a lot, the Rhineland pattern axes, is because they do have enough room to comfortably choke up. That modifies the center of gravity of the head. It reduces strain on your body. It increases accuracy. It's just more comfortable to use. So uh, for my two cents, the steel is, is great. Uh, I've had very good results with the steel. The profile, I think, is decent enough. Um, it's not superb for carving. It's not superb for splitting. It's a great all-around axe, which uh, this does a nice job of splitting the difference between a lot of different qualities. I just want more carving capabilities. And uh, for Holtzbrook, I think they should have, they are in that higher end category, they should have either a dedicated carver or a hatchet that you can carve with, which means more carving features like this, uh, this finger well here. Okay, so the third mistake that I think Holtzbrook is making with its existing product line is related to this Arvika. This is, uh, of course, the um, Arvika of Tasmanian hardwood fame. Arvika at one point was a fully independent forge. They were then purchased by Holtzbrook in the early to mid part of the 1900s. Um, Holtzbrook took the Arvika name, attached it to this ax, and then sent it over to Australia, where it has performed very, very well as a Tasmanian axe. Um, I've tried to record this, my, my thoughts on this axe a number of times, and I, I struggle with it, just articulating why I have an issue with this axe. Uh, and I think I've narrowed it down to just a couple things, some related to form and you know functionality, and some related to um, you know just aesthetics. Um, initially, I think this axe is an attempt to please everyone and in doing so it pleases no one and and this axe in its existing form i don't believe does anything particularly well and uh i i think that even in combination of the features that you would want to blend together to make a, a wonderful axe that's advertised for the purposes that this axe is advertised for they they selected the wrong ones um so initially uh, it has the weight. It's four and a half pounds. Uh, it has a wide bit, over five inch bit. Um, it has a, an extremely, extremely thin bit, uh, a thin grind here. Uh, but despite that, it ends up being ground to, I'm gonna say about 23, 24 degrees. Um, which I think is very, very strange. Very, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very strange combination of features to have a thin bit with a with a wide grind um if you want a racer you want something with a chisel grind with a knife edge something that's going to bury itself deep into not free clear softwood uh if you wanted to put a chisel grind on this arvika you would have to go so far back that you'd burn through probably half or three quarters of the temper line um, that is, it is just not something that I, I think is advisable. Um, also it, it is, it's ground, but it's not fully polished. Makes no sense to me. That's a very silly thing to do. Uh, if you are going to grind away the forging marks that, um, are really the quickest way to tell whether an ax was forged by somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh, those forging marks, it's, it's very difficult to hide sloppy work if you have the raw forged finish. Uh, they ground all that away, but then they didn't fully polish it, and then they sent it with the thickest, hardest to remove clear coat that I have ever come across. It, it is so hard to remove this. Um, it gums up your sandpaper immediately. Uh, a wire wheel melts it. It doesn't remove it, it melts it, and it like bakes it on. So it's now polymerized clear coat, it, it's horrendous. Um, so if you want a racer, if you want you know a nice shiny full polish racer, they make it really hard to turn this ax into that. Just a, just so just a very strange combination of features. Um, the bit is too thin, that ax is brittle extremely brittle. I don't care if you put a secondary edge on it or not. 
It's extremely brittle by, by virtue of its, its design. Uh, with a wide bit and extremely thin cheeks, if you get any kind of rotation when you're swinging or if your ax buries in a strange way, uh, you've got a lever on a thin bit. You're gonna snap the toe clean off. So it's really only suited for use in clear, soft woods, but it doesn't have the features that you'd want for an ax that's only suited for clear, soft woods. So very, very strange. Um, and it's, it's to boot extremely expensive. It's very much in that high-end premium ax range, um, $240, $250. Compare that to other Tas you know, true Tasmanian style axes on the market. This is the Helco work. Look at the difference in the bit there. That Arvika was maybe 23, 24 degrees. This is 20. So it has thicker cheeks and a thinner grind. You know, I, I, and, and it's, it's a bit shorter. So you end up with features uh, for a Tasmanian that are, are really what, what you'd want. Um, this Helco work is a great ax. It, it's expensive, but it's 30% cheaper than this, this Holtzbrook Arvika. Uh, if you're after a Tasmanian, this is what you want. If you're after a racer, you're probably going to have to cough up the money and buy a racer. Um, and what I'll say too is you can just about Custom order, I mean commission a racing ax, that will be made by somebody who is at the top of their craft, uh, an expert, a blacksmith of exceptional ability. You can just about commission a racing ax for $250. Uh, you're gonna need to spend a little bit more. You're probably gonna be into that you know, $300 to $500 range. But I tell you what, I would rather save up and spend $400 $450 on a racing axe that will blow me away, that will support a craftsperson who is developing skills um, that, that I value, that I am glad exist in the world. I would rather spend $100 more, $150 more for that axe than, you know, $250 on an axe that, it, it, you know, it, it just... It just doesn't check any of the boxes that I want it to check. Um, so if you're after a Tasmanian, this Helco work is a great mass produced ax. Um, I can highly recommend this. I've used it for splitting. I've used it for chopping. I've used it for felling. Um, this is a wonderful alternative to that Holzbrook Arvika. And, uh, and I think that it is a more well-rounded ax. Um, I would if I would prefer this as a racer over the Arvika in a lot of ways. Okay, so we talked a little bit about just the functionality and the design aspects of this axe. Um, I wanted to talk about just the aesthetics of this axe. Um, this axe never really wowed me. It's not a particularly beautiful axe. Again, I, I think I talked about just how hard Holtzbrook makes it to make this axe visually appealing. Um, with the, the horrible clear coat, the kind of like half grind, but not a full polish, very sharp edges. It, it's, a, it's a combination of a lot of very strange decisions that I, I, I think are a mistake. Um, but I didn't realize how much work Holtzbrook spent making this ax um, less aesthetically appealing until I saw somebody on the Holtzbrook Holtzbrook's, you know, kind of a fan club Facebook page, um, They'd taken the Arvika, stripped off the blue paint, which revealed just this really nice forged finish, and then they gave it kind of a uniform satin. It wasn't even a full polish. Um, it was beautiful. It was a gorgeous axe. It was everything that I wanted this axe to be, which for me was confusing because it seems that Holtzbrook has spent a lot of man hours um, just goofing up this axe. That forged finish is, is beautiful. It's what the consumer wants and expects in, in today's premium axe world, market. Um, I don't know who started it, if it was Grand Spores and everyone's following suit, but if you look at uh, the premium axe market, everybody is leaving the forged finish, which 
I think consumer preferences are gravitating towards if they're not there already. Um, anybody can take, you know, it's kind of like um, grinding and paint makes a welder what he ain't. You know, it's the same way in axes. Um, anybody can stamp out an axe, sloppy, and, and then grind it into the, the function that they, uh, the form that they want. Um, much harder to do that with a raw forged finish. What you see is what you get. Um, the forged finish to me is evidence of a manufacturer that knows what they're doing. So to know that at one point this Arvika looked like that was somewhat disappointing because if they just left the forged finish, you can put the blue paint on it. You know, that doesn't bother me. There's a nice Arvika sticker that the new ones come with. Um, you can put the blue paint on it, that's fine. But then it's the consumer's option to bring it back to that forged finish or not. So uh, when I saw that, that ax that someone did such a good job with on Facebook, it really drove home to me how, I, I'm not sure Hultzbrook knows what to do with this ax. I, I don't believe that they, you know, in a, in a way I think they lost the plot. It started out as a wonderful Tasmanian uh, they they tried to add some racing features and and then they're they're not really sure what to do with the finish so uh, i think bring it back to basics with a modern twist make it a tasmanian give it the thicker cheeks uh if somebody wants to add a chisel grind fine um but they don't have to do that if it's produced as a tasmanian with enough on the cheeks to put whatever grind you want on it uh leave the forged finish um if, if they don't leave the forged finish, at least, you know, make a nicer, make it, make it easier to take this horrendous clear coat off. Uh, I mean, you can see from trying to take it off, I've still got this just baked on horrendous gummy. I mean, that is atrocious. Why, why they ever did that? I mean, that stuff is unbelievable. Um, and I'm, I, maybe I'm a little worked up about it <laughs> just because I, I think this is an easy thing to fix. Um, and if it's fixed, I think it's going to improve this ax a lot. Uh, I think it would help Holtzbrook to do it. And I think it would give the user more bang for their buck and, uh, and, and make it just a more functional ax. Okay. So I hope this video was helpful. Um, I hope that my conclusions are taken in the way that I mean them in that I'm not trying to pile on Holtzbrook or disparage their uh, products or their brand. Uh, I just see a couple of things that are very fixable with their ax line that would ultimately probably streamline Holtzbrook's manufacturing process, but also give the consumer a better product. So um, I think highly of the Holtzbrook brand. I just see some room for, for improvement uh, in these three areas. And uh, I hope this video is helpful to the people out there who are consumers that watch uh, and also uh, from the company. I, I hope that uh, this is seen as an attempt to uh, help improve their product rather than disparage their products or brand. So um, if you got this far, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.